Hi, Bob. Hey, Bob. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bob, for arriving so we could uh, switch gears a little bit. As much fun as it is to talk about the vaccine. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of what I believe to be a six part series. Um, using the Isenheim altarpiece as kind of a, a jumping off point to talk about uh, a few different biblical characters and how they are represented and, and what we may actually know about them and uh, the, theolog the theology that has developed around them as well. Uh, Dr. Dan Deffenbaugh, the scholar in residence at First Pres Hastings, uh, is here to lead us through this series. I don't know that there's anything else that I need to introduce it. So uh, Dan, take it away. Okay, well, thanks, Damon. And thank you uh, everyone for, for showing up on a Sunday. I'm looking forward to um, getting back to face-to-face. -to -face. I'm by uh, nature an introvert, but it's getting to the point where I don't know if I wanna be as introverted as I have been. <laughs> <laughs> for the last year or so it's uh you know just to be able to go out and have a meal at a restaurant someplace or something like that uh but it does give me opportunity to do some reading uh i'm not distracted by um you know wanting to go out and go go out into public or anything like that and so uh the last three or four months or so i've had an interest in uh something known as the Eisenheim altarpiece. Now it's referred to variously, Eisenheim, Eisenheim altar, altarpiece. I, since I was in seminary, I've always heard it referred to as Eisenheim by my instructor, Donald Brugink, who actually took a group of students uh, to Colmar where this uh, altarpiece is. Uh, and I was able to, to see it. At that time, I was all of 24 years old and did not have the uh, historical or, or, you know, I guess uh, maturity perspective to really uh, appreciate uh, what I was looking at. But since that time, I've, uh, I've, I've really become uh, kind of uh, in, enamored of the altar piece itself, simply, uh, well, for a number of reasons I will go into. But this is a, a Lenten series. Uh, Ash Wednesday was just three days ago, three or four days ago. And this will take us all the way through uh, uh, Palm Sunday, I believe, Damon. I think I'm doing this on Palm Sunday. And what I'd like to do is this week, just give you an introduction to this altarpiece and, and what it, uh, uh, the role that it played uh, in 16th century and Colmar. And I'll show you a map here soon. Uh, about where this is. As I said, I, I have seen this and, you know, was, was struck by it even in my naive nature at age of uh, 22. Um, but now wish I could, you know, spend, see these benches down here that people are sitting on. I know they would kick me out because I think I would sit there for about three or four hours just contemplating this. And, and hopefully uh, at the end of this, uh, session today, you'll get a sense of, you know, just why this is such a, a, an interesting uh, piece and, and how it served uh, a purpose in 16th century Colmar. But what I'd like to do for this Lenten series is, as I say, this week, offer just an introduction to the altarpiece. Um, it's, it's painter, it's uh, uh, use in this convent, this Antonite convent. Uh, Actually, it, it has gone in and out of, of the hands of many people since this time. And it's such a circuitous route that it's taken. I can't really uh, remember all of it in my head. But, you know, when you think about World War I, World War II, and uh, Colmar's in the Alsace region, right there between France and Germany, uh, and the amount of art that was well stolen by the Nazis, uh, the amount of art that was destroyed uh, in, you know, let's say the 30 years war. It's amazing that this altarpiece as big as it is, uh, has survived. Um, but it is a, a piece that was constructed in the 16th century. And 
served a very particular purpose. Um, so here we are, you can see Colmar is in present day France, though it used to be in Germany. At one time it was under the, uh, uh, under the political domain of Denmark, I believe, or perhaps Sweden. Uh, this is an area between Germany and, and uh, France that has been fought over, you know, so it's going back and forth. But uh, there has been a, a convent uh, here uh, since about the 13th century. Uh, and this is where uh, this is where the altarpiece first comes into uh, existence. Um, you can see be, back to the picture we were looking at, this would have been the church proper of the convent uh, with its, uh, you know, the webbed bracing, uh, you know, classic Gothic design. Uh, and the altarpiece would have been, now this is a museum, so the altarpiece would have been further back behind what's known as the, uh, the rood screen or the cross screen. This is where the, uh, uh, the sacrament would, would take place. If I could show you over this open area here would have been the place where people would have heard the message, you know, the, the priest would have been speaking. Uh, and then when the sacrament, which is, you know, the mass is really the center of the Roman Catholic worship. The, the, we as Presbyterians, we've, <laughs> we've put the focus on the word, the small w word, thinking that is through the word scripture that the big word, uh, capital word is, is most uh, uh, properly uh, seen. Uh, but in the Roman Catholic tradition, as I'm sure you know, that uh, uh, an encounter with the word takes place in uh, the sacrament itself. The homily is not the place that is given primacy. And so um, we would have, uh, you know, if this were still, there wouldn't have been pews in this area. People would have stood at this time. Uh, but right over here, over where my little cursor is, there was, there's this, you know, uh, altar, not an altar, uh, pulpit where uh, uh, the priest would have spoken from. But this altar piece would have been behind the rude screen and in front of it would have been where the, uh, the uh, sacrament would have been, uh, would have taken place. And I, I'm not sure if you know about this, but, um, you know, the Catholic mass was, was observed in Latin all the way up until Vatican II, which is in the 1960s. And really produce, you know, the, the masses did not understand Latin whatsoever, right? And so there were all of these um, misconceptions about what happened in the sacrament. So in front of this altarpiece, when the, uh, when the priest would take the elements and you know, he'd say, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, which is poured out for you. Uh, but he would say it in, um, in Latin and of course, the people didn't understand what was going on. So, and so one of the phrases he uses is in hoc corpus meum. In this is my body. No, hoc est corpus meum, excuse me. I was, I'm getting that confused with uh, in hoc sigma, but hoc est corpus meum. This is body mine. This is my body. Uh, over time, and then you know, that, those were the words of institution. And then a bell would be rung. And then mysteriously, the, the elements themselves, the bread and the wine would become uh, the actual body and blood of Christ. Well, uh, for the longest time, you know, the, the masses, the peasantry would think, you know, there's some, some sort of magic, you know, some sort of magic uh, event that takes place. And they came up with, they, they found themselves repeating these words, you know, to try to create some sort of magic in their daily lives. And those words became hoc est corpus meum, hoc est corpus, hocus pocus. <laughs> so these days when you hear a magician, you know, pulling rabbits out of the hat, the words hocus pocus, you know, uh, actually comes from that uh, 
uh, from that Latin uh, mass that people would hear. And so, I, you know, that's really neither here nor there, but, but there is mystery in the 13th century, uh, 14th, 15th century uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. The church uh, rules, you might say, by mystery. And where we are in, the, um, in this particular period and in this particular geographical region is an area that is uh, plagued by pestilence, by plague, by all kinds of uh, diseases that seem overwhelming, something that we can certainly, uh, certainly relate to in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And so the only way really uh, that you were going to be healed from these diseases was through intervention from God. Uh, medicine was at best a kind of herbalism at this time uh, and was actually uh, many of the monks would, uh, I guess, experiment with various herbal types of remedies, particularly for this reason, because of, of plagues that were happening uh, at the time. Um, you might know of the uh, liqueur called chartreuse. Uh, if you don't know about it, you might want to try it because um, its history is of from this very region. And it was originally an herbal tincture, you might say, uh, an herbal treatment that tried to, uh, you know, treat the, uh, the diseases that we're talking about mostly the plague, the black plague, but also the various types of pestilences. Um, and I, I happen to like chartreuse. It's, it's not terribly a pleasant taste, but it is a very, it's got 150 herbs in it, supposedly. Uh, and, and it's been produced in this region since the middle ages, according to uh, the legend around it. Uh, but the reason it was produced uh, now, you know, just kind of a happy little aperitif, but the reason it was produced is this, this along with prayer was about the best thing that you had going for you if you were to be, you know, victim to uh, some of these um, diseases that were very, very common at the time. So the altarpiece itself was uh, painted by a man named Matthias Grunewald. <clears throat> uh, we don't know much about Matthias Grunewald. Uh, he seems to have been maybe an apprentice of an artist named Schoenberg uh, because a lot of the imagery that we see, for example, St. Anthony uh, seems to use Schoenberg as the, um, you know, as his template. Um, but Grunewald uh, has a, a particular affinity with this convent that allows him, and you'll, and you'll understand what I'm saying soon, that allows him to depict Christ and the crucifixion uh, in a way that is um, particular to this area. Uh, let me just show you the next uh, slide here. This altarpiece would be used during the seasons of the year. And I'm talking about um, the religious seasons of the year. Moving into Lent, uh, remember we have a, almost 99.9% uh, illiterate public who are going to mass and listening to a, a language that they don't use at all. So there is the only thing that they have to focus on are these visual uh, images. This altarpiece stands about, well, you can see the, the height of it before. Uh, it's about 14 feet. It's on, it's on a little pedestal. Uh, it's about 14 or 15 feet. So it really takes up quite a bit of space here. But let me uh, get back to where I was here. Um, you can see, and these are the images, these are the people we'll be focusing on over the next uh, five weeks. Uh, on today, we'll look at the two patron saints of the convent. Uh, remember at this time, praying to the saints, especially if the, the relics of the saints, particularly the bones of the saints, were present in the convent itself or present in uh, the church, you know, the, the cathedral itself, 
Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, that tincture I was telling you about, there would be certain times during the year where you know people would receive the tincture, but also the bones of the saint would, you know, they would be. Um, I, uh, some of the tincture would be poured out on the bones of, of the saint. Um, so you can see, it, it's, it's hard to tell just from a standing picture, but you can see that this has many views. It was going to be used at various times of the year. This would have been what you would have seen during the season of Lent, uh, moving and, and reflecting on uh, the suffering of, of Christ on the cross. Uh, but not only that, uh, looking at the two patron saints that I'll talk a little bit more about and their suffering as well. And then at the, the base of the altar was something called the Lamentation of Christ. This is the scene after the cross where Christ is taken down. And the people you have present that we're going to look at, uh, John the Baptist, uh, and of course, the, the famous line and behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world and, and lo and behold we have the lamb of god here and i'll you know when we look at this in the weeks ahead actually next week we'll look at john the baptist i'll try to find they're hard to find uh what are called details of these small places here uh mary magdalene who interestingly enough this is is identified as the woman who has the alabaster uh alabaster vessel, uh, the, the, the ointment that is of, of great price, you know. Of course, there's the vessel at the foot of, of the cross. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and this very interesting figure in the Gospel of John known as the beloved disciple. Many believe that's John himself. Uh, you ask many people today, they'll say, well, you know, Peter was the Jesus' beloved disciple. Well, that's in the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> But if you look in the Gospel of John, Peter is kind of adult, you know, and it's, it's the beloved disciple who really understands who Jesus is. So during the Lent, Lenten season, I want to watch my time here. So during the Lenten season, this would have been the uh, encounter that people would have had with the Lenten experience itself. And to just give you a little background on Lent, it, it has really been watered down over the 2000 years of, of the church. But in the early, early church, uh, Lent, let me back up and say, in the early, early, early church, people were baptized, speaking of baptisms, Damon, on one day of the year, on Easter. And so you would have a whole group of people who would go through the baptism on Easter. Yet prior to that, in those 40 days prior to that, there would have been a, a prayer and fasting that would have been undertaken by the whole congregation, not just the, you know, the catechists, uh, but the whole congregation. Uh, there would have been time of, you know, teaching and learning coming actually the whole year prior to that, you're learning about the faith, <clears throat> what we might call the you know, new members class, right? But the whole congregation would, would fast during this, and it would be a real fast. I mean, not uh, you know, not uh, just just fish on Sunday. <laughs> that is the watering down of the Lenten season. Uh, but it was very much like the mystery uh, religions of the Greco-Roman world. Uh, it was a highly ritualized communal event. Now we tend to look at Lent as very, very individualized. Well, I think I'm going to give up, you know, those Dove chocolate bars that I like so much, you know. Uh, but this was an event that uh, you would have experienced in the body of Christ itself. As you suffer, becoming a member of the body of Christ, i.e. the church, you go through the suffering of Christ as well. And this becomes all the more important on Holy Week. Now you've been fasting for quite some time uh, in the last seven days of the week um, are focused on, you know, the the road to the cross. And then finally, on Easter, you would have been baptized. Now, something of that is retained in the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, 
you know, right now, Roman Catholics are not eating meat on Friday. You know, that's something that the reformers in the 16th century thought, no, nah, we don't need that. You know, it's just uh, hocus pocus, if you will. So uh, let me let me stop there because I, I will go on uh, ad infinitum if I don't give you opportunity to talk. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. All right, go ahead, Lynn. It's, it's kind of like more of the, uh, the physics, physical aspect of this. Okay. It looks like a triptych. Do the, do the, do the wings fold in? Yeah. And was it on display all year or did it, was it only opened up during the Lenten period? Well, uh, that's where I'm going, interestingly okay. enough. Yes, actually, this right. is a triptych and it's, it's actually something known as a polyptych. In, in other words, there are many panels that open and close. So uh, this is the first view and that's, that's the, the great segue into this. But before I do that, are there any other questions? I wish I had a, a video that showed you how this, but try to get a sense. Your natural sense is that these wings, right? Would close like this, right? Close in, but what happens is these panels, you can see the line down the middle are gonna open up and out so that the second view looks like this. So you see, this, uh, excuse me. So you see this, this high part here, these two uh, protrusions now become protrusions over here. So it actually opens up this way. And here you would have during, and, and Lynn to answer your question, there would be some seasons of the year of ordinary time when it would be closed up. And actually there's, there's some, dispute on this, but uh, it would either be completely closed up or the third view would have been uh, present. Um, here is what we would have seen during the, uh, the Christmas season of Advent, right? Over here is Mary being told by the angel uh, that she, Angel Gabriel, that she is going to be with child and he was going to be the Messiah. Celebration among the angels uh, and you know, you can, you can find details of this. This is really interesting. The crown of Christ being brought by these angels here uh, and images of heaven are, are everywhere in this one. Uh, here is God uh, looking down upon the birth of his uncircumcised. And you could tell very clearly in the detail, Jesus, the child is uncircumcised here. It's before the eighth day when he's taken to the temple and, and presented and then, and then circumcised. But uh, Mary holding her child, Joseph is nowhere present in this, right? And then what seems like an anomaly here, um, this is, you, you talk about, <laughs> this is what Matthias uh, Grunewald, he is so interesting. Uh, talk about a touchdown Jesus, right? Uh, this is Jesus, bursting forth from the tomb you have the the roman guards down here uh and this is the resurrection so in the midst of this you've got this lenten series that doesn't look toward the crucifixion but towards the ultimate event which would be the resurrection but remember the lamentation of christ is still being uh seen from below so this is Jesus taken down off the cross. Here's the um, beloved disciple. Here's Mary, and here's Mary Magdalene. Um, John the Baptist, interestingly, was, was not present at the crucifixion, but it's important theologically for him to be there. So any questions about the second view? Here's the lamentation of Christ. Uh, and if you look at Christ's body, something that we'll talk about in the coming weeks, you will see, especially when you look at the crucifixion itself, you will see limbs that are extended and uh, don't appear to be uh, symmetrical, don't appear to be what you would normally see on, on, on a human being. Uh, let me see if I can back up a, a bit. 
For example, look at how Jesus' hands are, are malformed as he's you know, nailed to this cross beam of the cross. Um, and if you look very carefully, you can see his body is just filled with all kinds of lesions and all kinds of uh, you know, marks where he had been whipped. But also, it, it kind of looks like what you would expect from the plague as well. His feet are also, uh, we'll get a chance to see this in better detail, but his feet are also elongated. Uh, and you can kind of get a sense of that down here below. His feet uh, <clears throat> are, are malformed. And there's a reason for that. The third view, uh, which would have been uh, present during, you know, just the, the off season, you might say, you know, you have Advent, Christmas, and then Epiphany, <clears throat> which is a period of about six months altogether. And then you have the Lenten season, I mean, six weeks, excuse me. Then you have the Lenten season, which is a period of, you know, 40 uh, some days. And then you would have the patron saints of the convent being represented here. Uh, this is St. Anthony, and I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, this is St. Jerome and St. Augustine over here. St. Augustine is the founder. Excuse me, I'm going to back up a little bit. St. Augustine is the founder of the monastic order that would later become Benedictine uh, in terms of the way they uh, ruled themselves. Uh, and then St. Jerome is, you know, one of the, the fathers of the church responsible for uh, really bringing uh, the church into uh, the Latin world in terms of its scholastic uh, understanding of itself. So should I go back and, and do you want to look and see any of those other images? Any questions? Okay, well, uh, the convent itself was what known as an Antonite uh, convent. They were uh, devoted to Saint Anthony, and Saint Anthony is is understood to be the father of the desert fathers themselves, and and the father of what would later become you know uh, monasticism, uh, people cloistering themselves in the desert to focus on prayer, and and Saint Anthony has a very interesting biography. Uh, he was a, a a Roman citizen of some means. Uh, who decided to give up all of his wealth and go out into the desert and try to live a life of purity. But in the desert, he was assailed by all kinds of, of demons and, and what we might call temptations. You know, uh, There's a strong sense that, that St. Anthony had uh, you know, problems with lust after women. And so many of these temptations have to deal with you know, just trying to, to stifle his lust. And you know you can imagine a, a young man just in in the in his twenties probably having some problems with that, especially coming from a, a rather privileged background in Rome. Um, but nevertheless, he prevails. But the story of his uh, his um, temptation, the story of his overcoming temptation, is told in a biography by uh, one of his contemporaries named Saint Athanasius. Athanasius was also very uh, prominent in bringing to us the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, one of the early church fathers. And so uh, around Germany and France, there were uh, reliquaries as in, that, that held some of the, the artifacts of St. Anthony. And it was understood because St. Anthony was a healer as well, that prayers to St. Anthony uh, could bring about the result of healing um, some of the, uh, you know, the overwhelming diseases. And the one in Colmar was particularly uh, devastating. It was something known as St. Anthony's Fire. Um, uh, we know now, and we, they did not know then, but it was a result of a kind of a, a, of a fungus not a kind of a fungus, a fungus called ergot that would grow on the grains in partic 
particularly uh, humid times of the year. Um, uh, something that, you know, if ingested in large measure, uh, could have some of the ill effects. And, and then the St. Anthony's fire uh, is kind of the common name for what we know as ergotism. And this was the primary pestilence of the area. And the convent, the Antonite convent uh, in Colmar, where the altarpiece is, was responsible for, uh, and their entire mission was treating those who were brought to them uh, with this disease. And it was a disease that was fatal. It took two forms. Uh, one was gangrenous, in which the body would, you know, you would feel like you were you had ants crawling all over you. In Germany, they call it the crawling disease. And then you lose feeling in your extremities. And then your limbs basically turn black, you know, your, your legs. And, and it just starts to, um, it, it starts to rot you from the bottom up. And so uh, there, there were attempts and I can't even imagine this, it, it gives me, it makes me shudder to think of this, but there were attempts to, to try to heal this by amputations, right? And these were amputations with no, you know, anesthetic whatsoever. But, you know, these people would come to the convent and they would be laid before, now there's some controversy over this, but uh, the, the general sense is that the presence of the altar uh, and the presence of St. Anthony's uh, uh, relics and the, the sense that people have of the, uh, the suffering of Christ that Christ goes through that is similar to their suffering might be enough or would be enough to uh, kind of shock them into a kind of um, uh, understanding that would bring about healing. And so people uh, with ergotism found their way to Colmar, and it must have been a, a, a terribly uh, depressing place to be. The Antonite nuns, uh, by the way, who uh, were dressed very much like Mary looks right here, were responsible for you know, taking care of these, um, uh, these poor human beings that were laid before this altar to contemplate the sufferings of Christ in the hopes that they would be healed. Um, the other form of St. Anthony's fire was called convulsive. And this would be something that would be very similar to an epileptic attack, also uh, deadly. Um, but you would simply over time, you know, you would feel the same kind of symptoms in your body and then you would lose feeling, but then you would, your body would convulse to such an extent that it would be terribly contorted and you could not bring your you know, legs, let's say your legs were, were bent like this, you could not straighten them because of the, you know, the contortion was so rigid. And so you can get an understanding that Grunewald when painting this uh, crucifixion the contortions of Christ's hands, of Christ's feet, even his elongated body, his, his feet here and hands, uh, probably uh, were modeled on some of these convulsions that people uh, would have had. Uh, we have some evidence. Uh, this is from a later painter, Peter Bruegel, the elder, uh, who was, you know, painting nearby the present day Netherlands, the Flemish territory. Uh, but this is a portion of one of his paintings called the cripples or the beggars. Uh, these would have been people who had survived miraculously this uh, um, amputations of their limbs as a result of this pestilence. Uh, to the right here, you can see uh, these are wheat grains or rye grains. It grows on wheat, it grows on rye but you will see that one of the grains will pop out and it's called ergot. Now it was later understood by you know, chemists who did work on this in the 19th century that 
the chemical present in ergot uh, was lysergic acid, uh, which is the which is LSD basically, uh, which gives you you know it affects people differently, and different strains of ergot affect people differently. But there is um, a theory in place now that uh, this may have been the cause of the 17th century hysteria over witches in America, you know, 1630s, let's say in Salem, uh, Massachusetts, when you had women and men acting in very strange ways, you know, uh, sometimes their bodies would be contorted, other times they would be hallucinating. And you could only imagine at that time that th these were people who were being possessed by demons and Satan uh, was, you know, uh, at, at the heart of it and responsible for it. Well, now the understanding is that in America, in North America, many of these illnesses could have been caused by this ergotism. Um, you, you can certainly understand somebody on LSD uh, acting like they're demon possessed. Um, but it, it was never quite, the connection wasn't quite made uh, uh, in the 16th century or even before. Uh, and when you harvest your grain, of course, you, you can't pull out every single one of these little ergot grains, you know, this, these uh, fungi. And so there would be some seasons in which, you know, the, the wheat or the, um, uh, the, the rye would, uh, would overwhelm the, the presence of the ergot. But if it was a particularly, an especially humid, uh, and uh, you, know, you know, wet season, you would have a lot of this ergot in the grain, and thus you would have the um, the problems that we're seeing here uh, in uh, in Colmar. So, any questions about that? LSD. Anybody want to tell us about their trips, Bob? Dan, this is not a not a question, uh, but just a, a gentle reminder. You got about fifteen yep. minutes or so left. Um, I have to step out to start getting ready for church. But uh, my thanks to you and to everyone else for coming to join us. And uh, same time next week. Okay. Uh, Papa has told us that we only have fifteen minutes, so. Uh... <laughs> Uh, are there any any questions or comments? Uh, this uh, I find this fascinating, and the, the way that art plays into the spiritual lives of the peasantry and the Middle Ages. Um, well, let's then move on to these. Today, we'll just look at the uh, two side panels that would have been present uh, in the first view. We have Christ present in you know, hanging on the cross, uh, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and uh, John, the, the beloved disciple. And then underneath on the altar, the lamentation of Christ. But then you have the two um, saints that to, to whom the convent were, uh, the con people in the convent were devoted, both of them uh, having had much suffering in their lives. Uh, the one on the left, and it would have been the left panel, was a saint by the name of Saint Sebastian. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the LGBTQ community has, or at one time, I don't know if this is still the case, uh, has kind of taken on Saint Sebastian as their, um, as their patron saint because of the suffering that he endured. Uh, but Saint Sebastian lived around, uh, well, the middle of the, the third century, and he was Roman. Uh, he was a Roman soldier and was pretty up, high up in the Roman ranks. Uh, he knew Diocletian and Maximus, Maximian. Uh, now I can't remember. He knew, <laughs> he knew the emperors. Um, and he also, I mean, the story goes is that he became a Roman soldier because he, he was Christian and a Roman soldier in order that he could, um, you know, 
comfort those Christians who were uh, in the midst of their persecution, give them words of, you know, of, of comfort that would, would help them uh, move on into their, their glory. But it soon became evident that uh, St. Sebastian was Christian and Diocletian, of course, the emperor at the time, responsible for a lot of the persecutions uh, of Christians uh, in the third century, uh, had him uh, had him killed and, and killed in the most heinous of ways. He had the, his Nubian soldiers who were archers put St. Sebastian, you know, basically on a firing squad and and used him as a pin cushion, basically. They said, you know, he, they shot arrows into him to such an extent that he looked like a hedgehog. And then, as was common at the time, left his body there to rot, uh, which was common among Romans to do that. You know, just the, uh, uh, the ignominy of being uh, left naked out into the street and, and left as trash, basically. But miraculously, on the third day, St. Sebastian is resurrected. He comes back and he comes into the court of Diocletian, you know, healthy as has healthy and fit. Thank you very much. Uh, and upgrades them, <laughs> upgrades them uh, for their lack of faith. And of course, you know, after his proclamation, after his profession of faith, uh, is taken out and killed again, and then, of course, uh, taken as a, and recognized as a saint in heaven. Uh, we, we see some of this in our uh, study on Revelation. This would have been one of the, uh, the glorified uh, brethren or sisters uh, in the church uh, martyred. And you can see up here uh, the angels bringing his little golden crown uh, to rest upon his head. Um, He's got arrows sticking out of him, not even close to the number of arrows that are believed to have been, uh, you know, uh, present at that time. But Saint Sebastian offered hope to those people. First of all, he was very young; uh, he's in his early twenties here, uh, as were probably many of people who were um, succumbing to this ergotism, and he offers the hope that in the, even in the midst of his suffering and death, that he will experience and know, uh, you know in a very conscious way, the resurrection itself. And so he, he's a, a wonderful patron saint for those who are suffering and looking at an imminent death. Uh, even in this life, you will experience resurrection. The, um, and interestingly, I don't know if you would want this uh, designation, this moniker, but because of uh, an understanding, or I think in the ninth century, there were relics that were taken through uh, Germany and France at the time, uh, at, at the time of great plague. And uh, it was St. Sebastian's bones, believe, uh, as it was believed, that were carried through the streets and, and through the countryside. And many who suffered from the plague and pestilence were cured. So because of that, he has become the patron saint of uh, <laughs> pestilence, plague, and syphilis. So, you know, I guess there are worse things that you could be recognized for. But, but praying to St. Sebastian was, uh, you know, central to uh, those suffering uh, at this time. On the right panel, just let me give you a, a view of what this looks like again. So here's St. Sebastian and here's St. Anthony. On the right panel is St. Anthony, who is the patron saint of the Antonite order. So um, this image is kind of interesting. Uh, we know that St. Anthony was very, he was uh, tempted in his desert, uh, in his desert hermitage. But if you look at St. Anthony here, he, uh, he's kind of a chubby guy, you know, not what you would expect from uh, someone who, you know, is, is living a life of, of, of simplicity, 
Um, and at least art historians say the way he is, is holding out this little pinky, the way you do you know, when you're, you're drinking your tea, right? Suggests a, a kind of vanity, you know? He certainly looks like someone who succumbed to uh, not so much sexual lust, but lust after food. Uh, not exactly a guy who is, is, is missing a couple meals. But what you might not recognize, and I'll try to give you an image of this sometime if I can get my cursor to work, is up here in these windows, you can see a demon. And if, if I were to show you a detail, this would be a, a female demon who's throwing rocks at St. Anthony, right? Reminiscent of his many trials, trials that he very clearly has succumbed to, gluttony perhaps, maybe even sexual lust. This was very, very reassuring for people uh, at the time, you know, uh, that even the great saints uh, who fell from grace, so to speak, who, who were uh, unable to hold off the temptations of uh, the, the flesh, uh, could still rise to the favoritism or to the, uh, the, um, uh, the glory of, of God. They could rise to the, uh, that's not the word I'm looking for, uh, the favor of God. And so uh, part of the panel in the third view involves, and this is what the two outer, uh, I'm sorry, this is what the two outer uh, panels look like in that third view. The one I want to focus on here is, is one that really demonstrates not only Grunewald's uh, imagination and ability as an artist, uh, but also a sense of the, the psyche, the general psyche of the milieu, um, what they believed inhabited the world. If you look this is St. Anthony off in the desert. You know, you can see the world around him is, is blasted by sin. It's not exactly a place of great uh, vitality. But all of these demons, can, and eventually I can show you details of these. These are something right out of a nightmare. And it's only in the Northern re uh, Renaissance that you get this kind of imagery, very dark imagery. That's, that's probably a result of the plague and the pestilence that they have to endure, you know, decade after decade. Uh, but this is St. Anthony trying to, <laughs> to hold off all of these demons uh, that are, are assail him, assailing him from without. And none of them, they look, they are, um, oh, what's, what's the right words? They're, they're, they're hybridizations of things that are natural as if to show just how um, unnatural and how maligned sin is in the world. Uh, this is a wonderful image and, and you will always see St. Anthony uh, with his beard uh, split like this as a, you know, a symbol of his being uh, saintly, uh, a symbol of his prophetic uh, uh, calling. But you can see some of these, like this, this bird here with, with arms, you know, with some sort of bludgeoning instrument uh, going after him. Another demon here pulling at his hair. Uh, this, believe it or not, is a woman with her legs open. Uh, not the kind of thing you would expect to see in a church, you know, but they were pretty, pretty upfront about just how, uh, how the outside world of evil and of demonic uh, possession uh, was, was present all around. And so um, you try to imagine seeing this in, in a church that you would go to today, you know, right next to all of the, uh, the icons of Christ and all these saintly people. Uh, but this is the reality that they are living in. Uh, and I won't spend much time on this, but there's another hermit that St. Anthony visits in the desert, and his name is St. Paul. Uh, and the story goes that it, it is St. Paul who is really the founder of, of 
uh, desert monasticism, desert, uh, you know, a solitary existence. And it, it, this is a, a kind of um, a bringing, bringing St. Anthony into a sense of humility because he's often recognized as the founding desert father. But this panel uh, also tries to humanize him, right? He's not as big as he thinks he is. It's this guy right here. He, look at St. Anthony, he's dressed in blue. Uh, he's a guy who's enjoyed a lot of, you know, a, a lot of uh, privileges in his life. But the real founder is this man, St. Paul, not the Paul who writes the Gospels, but another Paul uh, who is living in this, you know, storm blasted uh, 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 desert. And much like uh, Elijah having the crows bring him bread, you can see up here. Uh, to, to kind of keep him alive. Um, so those are the two outer panels of that third mm -hmm. view. But uh, just in the few minutes remaining, our focus for the next four weeks, five weeks, is gonna be on this particular image. And I'm not going to talk so much about the art. This is our art talk today. And I'm not an art historian. I don't know a lot about art actually, but uh, I do want to use this as a jumping off place to talk about five figures. On Sunday, we will look at John the Baptist and the role that he plays in, well, not just the Lenten season, but also in the, um, uh, the story of Christ. Look at Mary Magdalene. Int very interesting story about Mary Magdalene. Uh, many believe that she was the woman who came and, you know, washed Jesus' feet with her tears, uh, was a, a, a prostitute. Uh, there's, there's no evidence for that, but that was actually a, um, that was actually an assertion that was made by a Pope, Pope Gregory, that the woman with the alabaster jar was Mary Magdalene, and Scripture does not say that uh, particularly, but she has been maligned through history as being, uh, uh, as you might imagine, uh, as being this woman of, of ill repute. And then by contrast, dressed in white, uh, the purity of, of Mary, who we've seen in those previous uh, images, uh, those previous panels, uh, being taken care of by the so-called beloved disciple. These three in the Gospel of John are the only people who are present at the crucifixion of Christ. In the other gospels, it's just women. Uh, but in the gospel of John, because this beloved disciple is writing this gospel, or at, at least is the source of that gospel, uh, he kind of places himself in this important role, uh, taking care of uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. So we'll look at John, Mary Magdalene, Mary, John, the beloved disciple, then finally we'll take a look at uh, on Palm Sunday, what the last week in Jesus' life uh, would have looked like. Uh, and much of this will be focused on what we can know historically about these characters and also uh, what their importance is theologically as well. So I hope you'll find it a, an interesting study. Um, you know, try to stay away from the ergotism uh, and the ergots in your grain. You know, you never know how that's going to affect you. So uh, that being the case, uh, are there any questions, comments before I end our little meeting here right on time? That's unusual, isn't it? Bob, thanks for joining us. Lynn, Will. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Always great. Always learn something. <laughs> yeah. Always, yeah. Kathy always, and I. Always something to learn. Yeah, Bob, you, you guys used to, you were raised Catholic, were you not? Yes. yes. And, uh, and I think we actually got to see this when we were uh, stationed in Europe. Um, oh, wow. So, but I wish I could remember it more. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. You know, youth is wasted on the young, they say. Right. Nice. Kathy was uh, particularly interested in the, in the whole ergotism stuff, um, and 
and also points out that probably the medial nerve being punctured by um, by the nails would have actually created the, the um, oh, really? spasms. So, yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Kathy, join in for it with us. <laughs> you know, I, 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 but be that as it may, I don't think that, uh, I don't think Grunewald is trying to be historically accurate as much right, as right. he was trying to be symbolically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, symbolically uh, oriented towards the people who would be viewing this, this, uh, uh, this picture. Um, yeah, yeah. You won't, you won't see contortions of hands like this in other crucifixions. None. Right. right. Yeah. But anyway, thank you. Um, and Kathy, next time, please jump in with your, <laughs> I forgot that you were here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we put it on, we put you on the big screen today so you could really see the, oh, the wow. Images. So um, that's why, uh, yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday. Okay, thanks. Perhaps. Bye, thank you. Bye.